Well, thank you. Um, well, I, I've got some apologies. But first of all, this is a rather long uh, paper, which I've tried desperately to cut down. I have, in fact. It was 20,000 words to start with, so I've reduced it a hell of a lot. Uh, by, uh, but uh, it was important to me uh, to talk about some of the philosophical aspects, or, or at any rate to uh, sketch a conceptual landscape within which to place uh, questions about morality and law and politics, especially in relation to Gaza. Uh, I've been thinking about these issues for a long time, uh, so uh, that's why I convened this series. Uh, the, uh, the first half of this is, is I, I hope, uh, well, it's philosophical. I hope not too densely uh, philosophical. More than uh, any military conflict since Vietnam, the invasion of Gaza raises questions about what counts as fighting justly when one's enemy mingles with a people like fish in the ocean, to quote the words of Mao Zedong, words that inspired the Viet Cong uh, to do exactly that, uh, forcing their enemy to choose between killing many civilians uh, and defeat. Ever since the time of Socrates, Western political thought has been haunted by the belief, or perhaps more accurately the fear, that morality and politics may be in deep and irreconcilable conflict. Not because politics is too disreputable for a morally good person to take part in it, but because at critical points moral and political conduct belong to incommensurable realms of value, both of which will claim the allegiance of any serious person. That doesn't mean, of course, that morality and politics are not in deep ways answerable to one another. Morality can't ignore the claims of politics, and politics can't ignore the claims of morality. Indeed, for almost everybody who has taken this conflict seriously, the mutual answerability of morality and politics to one another generates tragic conflict. The problem, insofar as one takes it seriously, is not limited only to the killing of civilians. The discussion of torture that occurred recently in most Western societies in response to September 11th was also haunted by it. In speaking uh, about it tonight in relation to Gaza, I'm conscious of a question posed by Avishai Margalit, a philosopher from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, when he gave a public lecture here a few years ago. Why, he asked, are people, especially why are politically committed intellectuals, so interested in Israel? Well, there are many answers to this, but I'm struck by one possibility that occurred to him. Was it, he asked, because they like to titillate themselves by playing with moral dilemmas? Well, while it's true that I've thought about the relations between morality and politics for much of my intellectual life, I don't regard the invasion of Gaza as only an interesting case study for moral, political and legal theorists. And that's why I spoke personally when I introduced Gary Simpson, who gave the first lecture in this series. I said then that I have an Israeli wife whose family on her mother's side lived for eight, at least eight generations in Jerusalem, and that I went as a volunteer to Israel when it was attacked by Egypt and Syria in 1973, and when it seemed in the first days of that war that Israel might lose it. I learned from my wife when I was passionate from, I learned from my wife at a time when I was passionately against nationalism, seeing it as one of the prime causes of political evil, what love of country can be when it's not corrupted by its counterfeit jingoism, or paranoid nationalism, as Ghassan Haas has put it. And from her, from the nature and quality of her love for Israel, I came to understand that when the country one loves commits serious injustices, then that love need not die. If it's lucid and doesn't yield to the temptation to deny those injustices, then pain is the form that that love takes, and severe criticism of one's country can be a form of its expression. And for that reason, more than others, my concern for the welfare of the Jewish state goes deep. And for that reason, I know also for its citizens to be able to love without shame and without lies is inseparable from a lucid conception of that welfare. It's therefore inseparable from a lucid conception of loyal citizenship. 
I had, of course, read claims that love of country could be as I learned it to be from my wife, and I knew instinctively that if there is such a thing, then it, like all forms of love, must be distinguished from its many counterfeits. But as is often the case with values that go deep, one comes to see depth or even sense where one had not seen it before because one is moved by someone's example, by what they do or by what they say or what they are, in a way that, upon critical reflection, strikes one as authoritative. And that critical reflection strives for a lucidity in which head and heart are inseparably combined. It's sometimes called an understanding of the heart. I was in London when Israel invaded Gaza on uh, December 27th last year. Condemnation of her was passionate and sometimes fierce. It struck me then as significant that, as I heard and read it there, the widespread condemnation of her invasion of Gaza did not seem to depend on an assessment of events before the invasion. There was, of course, some discussion, though it wasn't probing, of whether Hamas would have fired rockets so persistently into Israel if Israel had stopped or even reined in settlement programs on the West Bank, or if it had significantly eased its blockade of Gaza, or if it had accepted some indications by some of Hamas's divided leadership that Hamas was open to a long-term ceasefire for 10 years or so, though it would not acknowledge the legitimacy of the State of Israel. All these matters are, of course, relevant to an assessment of Israel's claim that any other state would have done as she did in similar circumstances because they're relevant to an assessment of what counts as similar circumstances. Israel's defence of all that it did rests on the premise that it had no alternative. There's good reason to believe that premise is false, but it seemed to me then that beliefs about the matter had little to do with many people's hostility to the invasion. Many people, it seemed to me, believe that the high number of Palestinian civilian casualties alone rendered the invasion morally unjustified, morally appalling indeed. Perhaps their judgment would have been different had there been many more Israeli civilian casualties. Certainly many of Israel's critics talked about the disproportionate nature of Israel's response, And from judging it to be morally disproportionate, they concluded that international law would also judge it to be so and convict Israel of war crimes, again just on account of the high number of Palestinian civilian casualties. But even if one thinks that Israel fought Gaza recklessly, callously disregarding civilian casualties, or even if one believes she inflicted those casualties deliberately as an essential element in a strategy of collective punishment, could one seriously believe that she could fight against Hamas and distinguish sufficiently, often, between civilian and military targets to avoid killing hundreds of civilians? People were already morally appalled when, before she introduced armour and infantry, the casualties were only half the number that were finally claimed by the UN. Well, while in London for the duration of the war, I'll call it that, a war, because that's the word that comes most naturally in English, even if the law would frown on its use, I also had the impression that whether or not people believed Israel's claim that Hamas fought and stored its weapons amongst civilian population made little difference to their condemnation of Israel. To my knowledge, no one in the mainstream media denied that Hamas was probably guilty of war crimes because it fired rockets against targets that were known to be of no conventional military interest and because it fought among civilians, but this seemed to trouble few people. They condemned it in sotto voce, as it were. They acted as though the fact that it was a war crime was a technicality that only pedants would make much of. No one in the mainstream media was inclined to say a pox on both their houses. Such was the response, as I understood it, in Britain, and I think much of Europe. I gather it was different here in Australia and certainly in America. But whether or not the response that I have described is representative or informed, it brings these questions into sharp relief. 
If it's true that Hamas would continue firing rockets into Israel irrespective of what Israel could legitimately have been required to do before the invasion, would Israel still have been justified in invading more or less in the way that it did, with a serious military aim of defeating Hamas, or at least of preventing it from further rocket attacks? Or would the predictably high number of casualties, even if Israel did all that it could to prevent them, have ruled that out morally and legally? Israel, of course, would answer yes to the first question. More interestingly, for the purpose of the lecture series, it would claim, as indeed it did claim, that every other state would do the same. And that's not merely an empirical claim. It's not just a claim about the facts. It's a claim that in acting as it did, on the assumption that it had no alternative, an assumption that I as I said, I think is dubious, but for the moment that doesn't matter. Acting as it did on the assumption that it had no alternative, Israel discharged an obligation that the very nature of politics imposes on politicians who are seriously mindful of the responsibilities that define their vocation. The alternative, this thought continues, is to renounce on moral grounds the only means available to protect one's citizens. I'd emphasise again that it's highly disputable whether the invasion of Gaza was the only means available to Israel. But the fact that the matter is disputable and the fact that Israel's invasion was condemned by so many people irrespective of whether they believed that she had other means available to her is why the Gaza conflict raises those questions more sharply than any other conflict I can remember since Vietnam. The Israeli challenge can be put like this. What do you do when your enemy forces you to choose between the slaughter of civilians and a serious military defeat. So far, I've put the matter as it might appear to Israel, but something similar can be said about how it might appear to Hamas. I think that hardly anybody seriously denies, I mean, denies and expects to be believed by anybody who's not gullible, I don't think anybody seriously denies that Hamas stores weapons and positions as fighters in densely populated civilian areas. As I remarked earlier, it appears to have had no choice about that, insofar as it seriously intends to retain a military option. In Gaza, rockets cannot be stored elsewhere, assuming that it would be military folly to store them in only one or two locations. And let me now add another supposition that may or may not be true, but which makes what is at issue more sharply visible. Suppose that the people of Gaza knew that Hamas would do this when they voted for Hamas in 2006. Suppose also that they knew that Hamas would provoke Israel to a tough military response. Finally, suppose that they accepted this because they knew that Hamas can prosecute a military campaign against Israel only if the number of civilian, civilians that Israel kills and maims when it responds is so high the international pressure will force Israel to accept a ceasefire before it can inflict devastating damage on Hamas. That does not of itself mean, as many people are quick to conclude, that Hamas hides in cowardly fashion behind its civilian population. Nor does it of itself mean that Hamas does not care about the suffering that it knowingly brings to its people when it intentionally provokes Israel to attack it. It means only that there is little point in its military campaign against Israel unless Palestinian civilians suffer more than the international community can tolerate. Only then will Israel be unable to prevent Hamas from claiming victory. Those suppositions, suppositions that I suspect are not too far from reality, locate in a distinctive realm of value actions that might be judged to be both morally appalling and also criminal, by appeal to the same notion of necessity to which Israel appealed when it said it had no choice but to invade, even though there would be many civilian casualties. Insofar as Hamas adopted a strategy that would cause much suffering to its people, suffering which in my thought experiment to which its people are prepared to consent for the sake of the liberation of Palestine, it was a strategy that looked to a distant future. But Israel does the same. For Israel, the issue was not what it could do to protect its citizens in Sederot or Beersheba or other places. The issue concerned the implications, not now, but 
not just now but for the future, of renouncing the only means available to protect itself and its people. Political entities, whether they're states like Israel or governments like Hamas, that renounce for the sake of law or morality the only means available to, for them to protect or to ensure, by, for example, struggles against occupation, the political integrity of their peoples, makes a decision not only for themselves, but also about the very nature of politics, as it has always been practised, and I think as it has often been theorised. At least since Plato, it's been argued that the renunciation of such means is not only the renunciation of the means to defend this or that political community, it's also a renunciation of the very conditions of political communality. That, I think, is what Israel claimed when she said that every state would do the same as she did. The existence of a Jewish state was not, of course, threatened by Hamas's rocket attacks, but those rocket attacks were by a government that is officially committed to the destruction of the Jewish state. From Israel's perspective, that commitment was written on every rocket that was fired at her. Her response was conditioned by that perspective and by the belief that it would one day have to respond as she did last December and that it would be better to do it when her survival was not actually at risk. Again, that's highly contentious, morally and factually, but the moral condemnation of Israel's invasion of Gaza did not seem to be based on the belief that that was false. And that's one of the reasons why I said that it was not just the invasion of Gaza, but also people's responses to it that raised fundamental questions about the relations between morality, law and politics. If I've been right in what I've said, then it's important to note that Hamas could appeal to the same concept of political necessity as did Israel when it claimed that it acted only as every other state would, meaning, I've suggested, that it acted as every other state must. Hamas could claim that what it was doing was an unavoidable part of a strategy to ensure the political integrity of the Palestinian people. When appealed to it is sincere and serious, the necessity is not, as it's often disparaged, to be mere expedience. It's arguably the expression of a value fundamental to the very nature of politics, but which may sometimes conflict irreconcilably with morality and with law. Torn between incommensurable imperatives, one political, the other moral, politicians seriously answerable to the requirements of their vocation must sometimes do what morally and legally they must not do. The world and our deepest values are sometimes tragically mismatched. If I understand some of the controversies in international law, it's a striking fact that even if civilian casualties on both sides are as reported by the UN, Israel might not be guilty of war crimes only on account of the marked difference between Israeli and Palestinian casualties. If that is so, then respected interpretations of international law are seriously out of step with the moral judgments many people in fact made. For one thing, those judgments were made independently of the consideration, important to law, of whether Gaza should count as having been under occupation at the time of the conflict. To be sure, the moral judgments I've reported were made in response to highly affecting television images, and it may be that reflection on the facts relevant to international law will bring many people's moral judgments more in line with the law. But, and I think this is both more likely and more interesting, it may not. Or at any rate, it may be a mistake to believe that serious, informed and impartial reflection by people of good will must, at least in principle, bring law, morality and politics into harmonious, reflective equilibrium, to borrow a phrase from John Rawls. Whatever one's belief about the relation between morality and law, no one, I think, believes that the concepts of a war crime or of, con or of a crime against humanity are simply concepts marking serious moral offences. Or to put it another way, no one seriously thinks that the moral aspects, perhaps the inexpungible moral aspects of a war crime or a crime against humanity, exhaust their legal meaning. One reason why the moral element of law does not exhaust its legal meaning is that it must be sensitive in ways different from morality to political realities. Not as those realities exist only at this or that time, but as they exist more or less permanently 
and have therefore become part of our very notion of the political. That makes it tempting to say that law must be more realistic than morality about the nature of politics, but that, I think, would be misleading. Amongst the realities are moral, legal and political realities, or moral, legal and political values, all of them, I would suggest, sui generis. I mean by that expression sui generis that none of them is legit- none of these values is legitimately conceived as merely an instrument that in its particular sphere of operation serves human interests as those interests could be understood independently of the fact mo- that we are moral and political beings living under law. To put it another way, To see morality, law and politics as sui generis realms of value that are interrelated, indeed interdependent, in complex ways, while acknowledging that none of them is reducible to the other or some other combination of itself and others, and that none of them is reducible to human interests and desires as they might be understood without appeal to moral and legal and political concepts. Sorry, that was a rather complex sentence, but (laughs) I've got someone here who expresses all that much simpler. Heinrich von Richt, Reich, or Richt is sometimes pronounced, expressed wittily the opposing view, the view against which it's argued that morality is too generous. There are, he said, many forms of value, but moral value is not one of them. He meant that morality is a means to achieve other things that we value, happiness, security, flourishing, for example. Values that can be understood and appreciated even by someone who cares not at all for morality. State of nature theories provide the classical example. They are answers to the question, oversimplifying a little, what rules would reasonable beings with an adequate understanding of the facts of life choose if they were concerned with how those rules best serve human interests and needs, insofar as those interests and needs could be understood even by someone who had no concept of morality. On this view, our essential human nature as human beings is merely served by moral, legal and political instruments. On the view that morality, law and politics are realms of value sui generis, on the other hand, our identity as human beings is, or became at a certain time, actually defined by the distinctive obligations of law, morality and politics. If, however, and this is the point of my little excursus into legal and political philosophy, one accepts that moral, legal and political values are sui generis, then there is no reason to think that they, can, that they are always compatible, that with imagination and will we can ensure that they'll never seriously and irre- irreconcilably conflict. It may be, as I suggested earlier, that law can never serve fully the interests of politics, that politicians must sometimes disregard the law if, their answer, if they are to answer responsibly to the requirements of their political vocation and also sometimes ignore the requirements of morality. In relation to morality and politics, that possibility has been foreshadowed in Western political thought ever since Plato and it's long been foreshadowed in the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians and made dramatically perspicuous, I believe, when Israel invaded Gaza. In Romulus, my father, which I mention only because some of you may have read it, I say that I learned from my father and from his dear friend Hora that morality is not the servant of our interests and desires, it is their judge. That is another way of explaining what I mean when I say that morality is a realm of value sui generis. It means that morality should not be thought of as the means that we use to achieve what other ends we may individually or collectively set ourselves it judges whether we can decently have such ends. Thus, morality cannot be conceived as a means to happiness, for example, because it will judge what happiness we can decently enjoy. It cannot be the servant of the common good, because it will judge what what a decent conception is of the common good. Morality, therefore, judges not only the means by which we achieve something, but also our ends. But, and this is my point, what I then said about morality I could have said about the law and politics, though I didn't see that clearly at the time. In the case of law, the idea that it has a value different from what it would have 
if it were merely, to oversimplify a little, an instrument to regulate our interests, is expressed, I think, when people speak, sometimes pompously to be sure, but not always, of the dignity or the majesty or the authority of the law. And that way of speaking gives a distinctive coloration to the shame that some lawyers felt when some of their colleagues argued that torture should sometimes be legal. A sense of shame that Jeremy Waldron expressed very movingly in a paper on the legalisation of torture and which, if I understand understand him, he distinguished at least implicitly from moral shame. Now, it's very tempting to say that the sense of conflict between morality and politics is a conflict within morality rather than between morality and something else, or even that it's a conflict between two, two radically different conceptions about the very nature of morality, one that places great weight on, weight on the consequences and the other on duty, for example. Well, that temptation is all, almost resistible, but it should be resisted because it expresses a moralistic idea that's at the heart of a dominating conception of morality. It's the idea that all other values, or, I'm sorry, I'll put it this way, it's the idea that no other value, other than moral value, may justifiably compete for the allegiance of a morally serious person who is lucidly aware of her circumstances. People sometimes distinguish between ethics and morality, There's no agreed way of doing this, but here's a suggestion. One can think of the ethical as a general category to which the distinctive values of morality, law and politics belong. And that's what I actually think. Though I suspect you may now wish me to, I can't leave the matter there entirely. And I must explain just a little more what kind of necessity it is, to which a politician soberly and seriously mindful of her obligations appeals when she says that as the leader of a nation there are things that she must do as a politician that morally she must not do. And a moral example might make clear the kind of necessity and impossibility that's expressed in such a statement. Imagine two people rushing to the theatre. A cyclist crashes near to them, falling to the curb, injured and bleeding. One, I'll call him Fred, says after a moment's hesitation, come on, let's ignore this, we have to rush. That, you'll notice, is a conditional form of necessity. We have to rush if we're to get to the theatre on time. Fred goes on to say, we shouldn't get involved. He says, you have no idea the trouble I got into the last time I stopped to help somebody. I got sued. And besides, there are plenty of other people to help. His friend, I'll call him Jasper, in honour of my new grandson, (laughs) says that he can't go on, that he has to stay to offer what help he can. To Fred, he says, don't you see what it means for someone like this to suffer as he does? Don't you see how the suffering is compounded by the fact that people just walk past? I recall in this connection... Inga Clendinen, Clendinen writing in her wonderful book Tiger's Eye uh, when she once collapsed at a tram stop, people all around her. No one helped. Lying on the ground, unable to get up, she saw a man's leg only a few feet away and she said she wanted to sink her teeth into it. <laughs> Sometimes we say that we can't do something, meaning that we couldn't do it no matter how hard we tried. Indeed, it wouldn't be true in this kind of case that we couldn't do it unless we couldn't do it no matter how hard we tried. In such cases, if someone suggested that we try or asked if if we had tried hard enough, we might say there's no point because we know we couldn't do it. But we would not say it was a suggestion that betrayed a misunderstanding of the kind of impossibility we meant when we said it was impossible for us to do the thing in question. A person might say, for example, that though she has no moral objections to killing chickens, she can't do it because every time she tries, she feels sick. And to her, someone might say, well, it's not so bad, you know, if you shut your eyes or it's easier if you chop their heads off than if you wring their necks or something of that kind. The same is true of someone who volunteers for military service in what she believes to be a just and necessary war but finds that she can't, in fact, kill another human being even though she thinks it would be justified to do so and indeed thinks that she should do so. 